appreciate that. So are we okay, Jim? We're sorted yeah. out. Sorted out. How's it going to be? Good. Yeah. I'm waiting to be told All right. when we're on. We're giving away as well. We're live. Yes. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Today, we're speaking to Dr. Nick Collistrum. I'm very excited about speaking to, I must say, he's a fascinating chap. And thanks for joining us today, Nick. Well, it's a pleasure, uh, Jim, to be on your um, Correct Not Political programme. Yeah. Well, Blando, thanks for joining <laughs> us. So, we spoke a little bit earlier on, and you said, first of all, right, because I'm, I'm saying you're fascinating, you've written loads of books. You're, you've been a doctor. A bit alarming, all these books I've done, yeah. It is. I don't know what made me write them all, really. But I want I want you to explain a little bit to the people listening what your background is a little bit, if you don't mind, and then we can get into it. So I'll give you, because you've done a lot of stuff and I, I can't be reeling that all off. My yeah. background? Yeah, like, how did you get it? Well, how did you get started in... Because obviously, <coughs> obviously you've written these books and you've written these other books about alchemical things. So well, in the last century, uh, I studied the... Uh, I worked on a biodynamic farm, so that Rudolf Steiner, esoteric type stuff, and um, I was very fascinated by issues, sort of alchemical, astrological, uh, and um, uh, so I, I did. I did that book, uh, Secret of Seven Metals, uh, and <coughs> that was the main thing I was interested in. Also, friends who were astrologers, and um, so what you might call esoteric subjects, yeah. <coughs> And um, also dabbled a bit in, in uh, crop circles and uh, went out to see them every summer. That was good fun. Uh, and um, I, I was a school math teacher for a while. Uh, and uh, th then another side of my work, I, I, I was at university. I was in the history of science department. And um, so, so I, I was studying the, the ancient beginnings of science. Uh, and... Uh, where it all came from and uh, how we got into this um, attitude of a scientific approach. Um, and uh, so uh, that was that went on for quite a number of years. And um, then this century, I got into the 9-11 uh, Truth Group. I started, it was a thrilling thing to be part of, these guys discussing what was really happening at that great event. And... Um, then, during that, uh, right at my college, my university, I was in the history of science department, the London bombs went off, right, 2005. And uh, I got fascinated by that. <coughs> and apparently my university didn't like that. They thought, well, you just got to, why can't you just believe what the government tells you about what happened? You know, what, what, are you causing trouble, sniffing around, trying to get the story? And... Um, so there's a group of us looking into what happened with the London bombing. And apparently I had a key role in that because I, I, it was I who discovered about the train times. Me and a colleague, we found the train times were quite impossible that the government had put out and uh, none of their story could have worked because the trains were all delayed that morning. Uh, and um, so, so one thing or another, <coughs> I got thrown out of my college, right, which... In a way, it's the most decisive thing that ever happened to me in 2008. And I got university damned by the media. I became the most heavily damned figure. Uh, and half my friends couldn't bear to speak to me anymore, you know. And then I followed that through and I did bring out the book about the London bombing, What Happened. Which, strangely enough, is almost the only book there is on the subject. And I found that extremely weird. Because like, there's done dozens of books about 9-11. And... Um, so my terror on the tube, I'm not exaggerating, it's almost like the, the book, if you want to find out about what happened on the London bombing. Is it so, right that the government actually changed what they said as a result of what you what, what you had found out? Yeah, yeah, they did, yeah. And a, a, a year later, they announced in the House of Commons that that <coughs> 740 train hadn't run, that they had to admit it, that, that their story could not be as, as it had been presented, yeah. So... Um, uh, I mean, I'm now the last 12 years, I've co-managed a, a sort of conspiracy-type um, discussion group that meets every month in London, <coughs> Current Affairs. And That's the um, Keep Talking group. Yeah, our Keep Talking group. And, and uh, there's a bunch of us that like knocking around these issues of 
what's happening to the world uh, and where are we going. And uh, I think various other studies I've done uh, are from interacting with, with, with that group, yeah. So that's a kind of um, background to uh, is it uh, how I got to be here now. Is it fair to say then that it was 9-11 that sort of woke you up to what atrocities the government be, would be willing to play on its own people? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think it was, yeah. That um, I think a lot of us didn't have much of a clue what was going on before then. Um, and and uh, that produced a whole new lot of kind of gurus and people who understood what the world was like. And a lot of the people in the last century who was like the sages, like very socialist, um, very socialist spokespeople, didn't get the plot and, and didn't understand that uh, this um, the, the, the nature of the um, whatever was guiding our world had this hidden hand to it. That there was this hidden force that uh, could make terrible things happen, but it wasn't done by who you think it was, you know. Uh, and, and that is the subtle twist that happened at the beginning of this millennium, that we had that cataclysmic event and it wasn't done by the people that the newspapers told you. And suddenly we're in a situation where most of the papers aren't worth reading anymore and you have to try and find out um, all these horrible wars this country keeps getting involved in, that there's a hidden motives for those wars. And, 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 and um, what, what is it? Uh, central banks central banks yeah it is very much well that's been so ever since world war one hasn't it mm. the, or perhaps a lot earlier uh, some people in central banks um uh, make the wars happen but what's new in this century is the uh the the, the should we say digital manipulation of of, of your reality mm. that, that you think you see um people doing bad things uh, and actually you you haven't seen that at all and that's what's called a state fabricated terror, which uh, is, as I've said, it's the main art form of this 21st century. We, we, we get these big things hitting the newspaper headlines. And, and, the, and the more important thing is that they, they need your fear. They create this right. fear. Right, OK. But why? What? <laughs> why? That's, that's, where I, that's where I want to go with it. Why do they want to keep everyone enslaved in fear? Well, that's obviously a big question. Uh, what one answer would be that the military industrial complex has got so big that it can control your politicians. We spend 50 billion a year on, 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 the, on the military. Uh, uh, part of that expenditure, they're creating the reasons for war. Is that in the UK? Sorry, Nick. Is that in the UK, 50 billion yeah, a year? Yeah, that's our expenditure. About £2,000 per taxpayer a, 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 a year. Now, that, that's, that's a partial answer, right? Now, you could give another kind of answer that all the Islamic countries um, w we've been bombing this century or have uh, been countries that Israel doesn't like or that uh, it, it designates as enemies. Uh, that, that might be another answer. Um, but uh, the, 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 uh, the reasons we're given don't ever make a lot of sense. Like with, say, say Libya. Libya was the most prosperous nation in Africa. Gaddafi was wonderful things he'd done for Libya. And that all had to be destroyed and pulverised. And, and and we're hard put to say, what, what, why is it doing this? Well, he uh, it was my understanding that he was going to get, he was going to have some sort of currency for Africa exactly, backed yeah. by the The gold back minerals. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So let's, let's focus on the question that you've asked. Why does the government need your fear? Mm. Um it's partly because the politicians we get in front of us are such kind of worthless characters. It will never, they will never have any idea how to improve your life. In fact, it, the thought would hardly ever occur to them. Well, what have they got to offer you to make your life any better? Um, absolutely nothing. But, but they understand if they can get your fear, then you'll listen to them. Now, in the last century, they used to be able to get your fear with the finger on the nuclear button mm. <laughs> threatened to press the button and we all listen up you know and that faded away around 1990 um and, and the deep fear of nuclear war has has faded away uh, and and uh so that they want to be able to say something 
that you will listen to and and and, uh, uh, and uh, so they, they need an enemy to do that <coughs> so they've mocked up the, all this century they mocked up the enemy of Islamic menace that's what the whole 9 level event was about to create this new what I call the phantom menace that's the second part of the Star Wars uh, the, the, the six part Star Wars the phantom menace and something that doesn't really exist but the state will generate it for you uh, and it's so the whole image of spectre of Islamic terror we get a, a terrific sequence of fabricated terror events like Drummer Lurig being in the Manchester Arena bombing Westminster Bridge uh, and these are spectacular and very complicated very complicated um, the theatre created and who, who's creating them well it's partly British intelligence partly the Metropolitan Police partly the BBC a whole lot of people are collaborating in, in a mock-up scenario that actually isn't quite real and, and while they're doing that and are they using your tax money to do it who, who said they could do this uh, and uh, we all need to uh, get together and really talk about it uh, and address this central question you, you asked me why do they need your fear I mean, there might be a metaphysical reason that. Uh, well, and well, yeah. This is this. The guy, yeah, sorry. Well, please. I'm a science historian. My my, my books are, are quite fact. I hope I hope are factual and detailed, and I, I don't speculate about who's ultimately in charge of our world. But if if there's a metaphysical re reason, there might be some sort of uh, demonic entities that that need your fear, that get nourishment from uh, a continual population that lives in fear. The Archons. Archons, <laughs> okay. Um, that, that might be the case. And, and do, do we need to know that if it is so? Uh, well, I'm not answering that question, but I'm saying don't give me your fear. You, you don't need to live in fear like this. Uh, and the best way of not living in fear is to get together in a group and, and, and talk about it and take some sort of action, whatever you choose to take. But you do something. It might be saying I won't pay tax for this or our protests or write a letter but d do something so that uh, uh, you don't accept the enemy now we've had a very dramatic switch in the enemy image exactly as George Orwell described in 1984 that the enemy suddenly changes uh, it was Muslims the whole beginning of the century endlessly we were bombing Muslim nations in a horrendous manner and then 2017 it all ended suddenly Oh, where's it all gone? What's happened to Islamic terror? No, and that's Russia. Suddenly, big bad Russia, and British intelligence is, has a key role in pushing the whole of Europe towards World War Three. Well, well, why is this? Why on earth should Russia be an enemy? You know, uh, what, what what is there that people want to ha hate Russia for? And we're given a series of terrific fictional chemical poisoning stories. That the Skripal affair, 2018, did some Russians come over? with a perfume bottle full of novice shock and spat on a door, door, door knob. Well, actually, no, they didn't. Um, and then two years later was Navalny, a political activist in, London, in Moscow, in, in, in Russia. Was he poisoned with novice shock? Uh, and uh, he was temporarily knocked out by something, maybe a bit of cocaine he was taking or shortage of uh, or exhaustion as a hyperactive character. But then he recovered and he was totally well a month or two later. Um, and, and there's a terrific propaganda as if Russia's doing this. And I just mentioned go earlier, 2006, there was a, a, a Litvinenko affair with polonium. Uh, again, I, I've got my book, The Novichok Chronicles. I go through those three events. Um, you may say, well, it's not much fun, uh, not much fun um, going over these sort of complicated British deceptions. But the point is. All the details may fade away in your memory, but you're given the fear image. Oh, this is the sort of thing the Russians do. Well, no, it isn't, actually. It's the sort of thing that British intelligence brews up. And, and um, uh, let's have an objective inquiry a, a, about this. Um, a, a, and uh, why is it our whole civilization seems, seems to orient it to generating these uh, hate images? And we had there was a terrific drama, 2014, about MH17 shootdown. Supposedly, a plane took off from airport in Schiphol, Amsterdam, shot down right over the Ukraine, where where the conflict is. East Ukraine, where the conflict now is. Just at the time when 
a, a, a genocidal bombardment was starting against the people in the, the Russian country in East Ukraine. Wh why did that happen? Um, well, we've never had any inquiry about it. There's a whole lot of question marks surrounding that. It's not the slightest bit evident that Russia did it. Um, the inquiry that was held um, forbade, banned Russia from participating. Russia said, look, we've got a lot of data here, a lot of satellite data. We can show you about our data about this plane, where it was, where it was flying, where it, how it was shot down. Oh, no, no, but all that. No, no, sorry, you're not allowed to be part of the inquiry because you're getting the blame. Blame is preordained against Russia. Uh, so th that was a complicated, complicated state for, for it was done between uh, Ukraine and NATO uh, 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 as a uh, fabricated event. It's very complicated. It's not at all, not even not clear that real people died in that plane. Whole lot of question marks all around it. And can we not have a proper inquiry to find out the truth? No, we can't. No, no. Sorry, believe what I told, and Russia's to blame. So we we we're given these events. Uh, and the purpose is kind of hidden. What, 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 why is it we're, we're being pushed to conflict with Russia and this dreadful unity that Europe seems to have now? We were told that EU was some, um, you know, we would benefit economically from it. And the whole EU now seems to be synchronising with NATO as a anti-Russian group, uh, as if uh, all the steps taken by NATO and EU now make sense if if Europe wanted World War Three, if we wanted to push towards conflict with Russia. Well, uh, how, how do we get into this situation? And do we really need an enemy? I, I suggest we, we want a culture which takes the view that actually, we don't need an enemy. And if we have got an enemy, the enemy is within, it's our own military industrial complex. Right, so the enemy is within, but they need a phantom menace in order to get the electorate to vote to go to war with the phantom menace. Totally, yeah. That's yeah. basically what, yeah, yeah. what it seems like. Yeah. So, but that is that is you that is working on the premise that democracy is functioning and like a real concept. Do you well, do you do you believe voting works on a separate note? Nick? Well, we got very small proportion uh, uh, vote for uh, whoever, whichever party is going to be in next, don't we? I mean, we all know that the Prime Minister is now taking us into war with Russia has not been elected, mm. and we all know pretty well he's going to lose the next election. Uh, and and uh, so, so he does not have any kind of mandate from the people for what he's doing. So voting doesn't work then, basically, because well, we didn't get to vote. Well, most of us don't believe there'll be much change if Labour gets in instead of the Tories at the next election. Oh, it can always get worse. Can always get worse. <laughs> can always get worse. Yeah, it will get worse. So. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, let, let me let me come back on on democracy. Do to, to believe in it? What happened last September in eastern Ukraine? was that the little mini-states, I've got oblasts of Luhansk and Donetsk and Zaporizhia, um, they, they had been shelled continually for eight years. Mm. All their schools and public buildings and scat landmines scattered all over where the children play. And they've been denied water, electricity, gas, uh, and treated in any way, everywhere as enemy nations. And they decided to have a vote, right? They came out to vote, and the question was, do you want to leave Ukraine and become part of Russia? Because traditionally, it's an ancient Russian culture, okay? In East Ukraine, Russia, a thousand years ago, the ancient culture of Russia began in East Ukraine, in Kiev, Rus, mm. R-U-S. That's where it began, the, right? The, the ancient manuscripts of the Kiev and the Russian manuscripts are actually written in Kiev, aren't they? Written in Kiev, yeah, yeah. So this is where it all began. And so those Eastern Ukraine states... They asked the people to vote. Would they like to rejoin Russia, join the Russian Federation? And about 80 or 90% of them did vote, of the electorate, at least 80%, and they voted yes. Yes, we, we do on that. And it was difficult for them to vote. They had to have mobile booths for voting because you couldn't have a stationary one. It would just get bombed. And uh, anyone assisting that electoral process was targeted by the 
the Ukraine government for assassination, and uh, some people were bumped off. And throughout Europe, a warning was given out. Anyone who in any way publicises or helps these elections uh, will be, uh, a criminal action will, will be taken. And throughout all the media, if you remember those elections, only two words were used, I notice. Uh, one was illegal uh, and, and the other was sham, sham and illegal. That was is, as it were, agreed by the media. Those are the only two words that were going to be used. And uh, I checked out, there were some independent observers. People complained they were mainly um, East European or pro-Russian or Indian. Well, of course they were, because European, other West European observers were banned from participating. But those... Uh, those seemed to think it was perfectly valid elections. And I, I knew one of them, actually, a lady called Vanessa Bealey, who writes for Off Guardian. She was there as an independent observer. And I think if she said they were authentic, those elections, then I'd say they were. Anyway, after that, they applied, those little mini states applied to join the Russian Federation, and the Russian Federation accepted. So they are now part of Russian territory. It's called Novo Rus. I would say that is democracy in action. Uh, and um, if we believe in democracy, I think we should believe or uh, agree that those little East European states are part of, of Russia now and not part of Ukraine anymore. Um, uh, so this war going on is about a difference in perception. The, the, all the NATO, all the, all the European propaganda will say, oh, Russia has invaded this country and we've got to push it out. It's an invader, aggressor. So, um, the, 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 it's it's hard for me to get my head around concepts of democracy in action when you, you you can see photos and videos of people like Putin and Zelensky all wrapped around the same sort of people, like the your Bud Lubavitch people, and going to the wall with the hat on and all that sort of stuff. So to say democracy working and then. Just, just, do you know what I mean by that? It's like Not this, entirely, no. Right, so you've got, photos, you've got photos of Putin and photos of Zelensky. Oh, well, I don't know if the Zelensky one's at the wall, but at the Wailing Wall, yeah? Uh -huh. Surrounded by rabbis. Yeah, yeah. Right? Well, he is Jewish. He's a Jew, obviously. Who's Zelensky? Yeah. Right. Putin ain't no, is he? No. Right. But the point is, he, they're around the same sorts of people doing the same things and that. Is well, it, I, I, really I, I, as, as you know, any American leader, and possibly Putin as well, has to accommodate these people uh, and uh, some degree. I would say Putin is, I would say he's a Christian and goes to the Eastern Orthodox Church. Um, but, but he uh, wears a kippur when he goes and touches the wall. Well, I haven't seen him touching the wall. You actually. haven't seen that? No, you reckon oh. he does? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay, okay well, I, I certainly believe you say so something that. Yeah, I'm rather surprised, but uh, I think we'll under well, I think we agree that uh, who is controlling our world that, that they have to make some sort of um, a base us to to that. Um, well, yeah. well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure we do because I I think there's there's more of a a, a Vatican a Masonic influence involved in it as well. I don't just think it's. Sort of. I, I, as I see it, there is a real conflict between uh, different, almost different worlds, really, and different ways of living. I, I don't think there's all uh, agreed, uh, agreed that they're all in, in it together in mm. that sort of way. Mm, yeah. my, my view is that Russia is the last white Christian culture uh, and it is hated because it refuses to promote sodomy. You'd be arrested um, in that country. No, I wouldn't. Yes, you would. <laughs> yes, you would. One well, word for this for this book, you'd be arrested in that country. You're not allowed to revise in in Russia. I think. Uh, well, I'm not sure about that. Prison actually. sentence you get, Nick. Um, well, there was at one point, uh, but uh, uh, anyway, I, I'm not clear about 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 that. But, well, this uh, is the yeah, but this yeah. is the point. Like you, yeah. you're saying, it's the last Christian white country, and that. Yeah. I'm saying, well. Is it because you're not allowed to you're not allowed <laughs> to talk about certain things without going to prison for I it? I thought some revisionists got off in, in in Russia recently and that he, he wasn't imprisoned. But oh, you, you right, may be right. You may be right. I I can't swear to that. No. All right. 
Well, anyway, so you do think it's the bastion. It's the last sort of... I think it's a very important independent culture, and that's the reason why it's under the, attack. the enemy, uh, the empire has to have it as an enemy. Not just that it's a big country with a lot of raw materials, but uh, it has this degree of independence that uh, <coughs> it's one place where the white race was... Well, it seems to be one place where the white race will survive, whereas Europe will go brown this century. And I, I think that's also being a Christian culture. I think that is one reason why it is hated so much by the empire. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, it's, it's legislation. It doesn't allow this kind of gender bending going on in schools, for example, mm. of uh, how many genders are there. That, that, that is not allowed in Russia. Uh, and uh, so it's holding on to traditional values, uh, yeah, w which the West hasn't managed to do. Right. No, right. So what, can, what, what are you going to do then? You're going to move to Russia? Well, I'd love to go to Russia at some point. I never have been. Um, I mean, I think we should praise Russia. So a wonderful, uh, you know, uh, wonderful romantic classical music, glorious ballet dancers, lovely churches and cathedrals, deep, profound li literature, um, high-powered, pure mathematicians. Um, I, I think the things it offers offers us by way of culture, it's got young people who actually read books, you know, and, and talk about them. Uh, I think this is a, a culture which... Uh, which one should admire, uh, and, uh, and uh, I think the idea of war against it is absolutely mad. So just a just a quick little going into Moscow a little bit. What is the um, what's the influence in the architecture in the Red Square around all them buildings? So they, they do look out of place, I think, don't they? <laughs> I don't know, out of place. It's just that's the Russian style. Is that what it is? That's the Russian R Russian style. It, does it? Does it, I think it looks a bit. It does not look With a bit, a onion bit type Arab -y. Is it a bit Arab -y? Um Is it Arab influenced, do you think? Or? Uh, maybe a bit, a bit sort From of the oriental, days. but it's a distinctive Russian style, isn't it? Yeah, with yeah. nice bright colour paints. Yeah. Yeah. Like some yeah. sort of Mongol influence yeah. or something. And any mother with, with kids, I recommend Russian fairy tales as being the best. Really? Yeah, yeah, lovely fairy tales. Like what, for instance? What's the well, I don't know, I can't remember them. But, ah. uh, give me a break. I haven't got any kids, uh, Jim. I don't have any kids. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. So what's your fav what, What's your favourite book out of all these books here? What's your favourite book? It's got to be this one, isn't it? False Flags Over Europe. Well, that's sort of grim reading. As it's important. It's, it's heavy reading, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, um, I mean, in a way, I, I'd like readers to tell me that I would say the most enjoyable one is the one my old book, Secrets of Seven Metals. This one. That, that is alchemy. That's hardcore alchemical. Yes. Hardcore alchemy, that. More present. And, and it's about a connection, traditional connection of heaven and earth. Uh, and uh, I think it brings a lot of fun into chemistry. My mum was a chemistry teacher, you see. Right. Okay. Uh, and, and so I, I, I like simple chemistry. Uh, and and uh, The heavens. The heavens. Is that is that a Christian definition of the heavens, or is that an alchemical something separate? Well, something separate. Yeah, so seven planets traditionally linked to to two metals. So gold was traditionally linked to the sun, silver to the moon, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, yeah. So the heavens are just the planets. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. So for all intents and purposes. All right. There's another another thing I wanted to ask as well. Something that uh, because we we have a mutual friend, and I, I actually borrowed this book from him, and he, so, I and I know someone else as well who, who takes issue. So, with the Lee Rigby stuff, right, right, because you, you're you're saying that he wasn't he wasn't murdered, didn't you? Certainly wasn't murdered. Uh, whether he actually existed is another issue. Yeah. I mean, I was there. I went there a day or so after. It's an overwhelmingly powerful experience. Go to that uh, Woolwich place and see all of the um, flags and flowers and messages written out all the way down the street, all the way around the corner. Uh, St. George's flag, Union Jack, uh, bottles of beer, 
left open for, for the dead, for the dead man, right? Offerings. I and mean, I've never seen such outpouring of flags. So whoever does these events knows how to pull the heartstrings of the British people. And uh, the car allegedly rammed up onto the pavement and hit this uh, pole, holy notice board. And my friend went the next day and he saw the pole had not been touched. There was no dent in the pole at all. So it was a purely theatrical event. A car was put there uh, and uh, none of it could possibly happen. Um, uh, the idea of two two terrorists leaping out of a car with an axe and hacking his head off uh, and uh, there wasn't any blood on the pavement uh, I think a bit was put there and the next day there was one picture put there a day or so later which had some blood and then something was thrown out into the middle of the road and all the pictures throughout the media didn't show the head there was no head visible it was blurred out or not visible and there was certainly no blood there at all um, and then when, when they carried it away in the evening, you could see on a plastic bag, you could see it was fairly light. It wasn't a real human body, sort of some plastic thing. So in that instance with the Lee Rigby, you are suggesting that he wasn't a real person in the first place. <sighs> in my book, I think I think I didn't I think I didn't doubt that he was I accepted he was a real you real should, person. I beg your pardon. I, even even though you couldn't see Royal Fusilier Guards. You, you couldn't track where he'd been. Um, the Fusilier Guards he was supposedly part of had been folded up. There were no, pho no credible photographs of him in, in the past. See, there are immense revenue streams coming in so that the family, to anyone who claimed to be the family of Reed Rigby, uh, there'd be millions of pounds, donations, that people wanted to help. Well, hang on. What, you've got record of that? Well, you know, you you know, there's they definitely got money. Well, I don't want to get into a lawsuit, but but, <laughs> but yeah, my understanding was huge, right. uh, and that's why there were different women claiming to be related to him. There was one, one woman who said, "Yeah, well, I got married to him. Yeah, I was engaged," and then there's another woman who said, "Oh no, he was my true love, uh, 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 and um, he's going to be with me," uh, and that's to do with people who can claim to get money fr from from this event. So, so, <clears throat> so I, I, I think that was a huge business. And there was a guy called Chris Spivy. I don't know if you ring his bell at all. No. He had a blog, and he put up a lot of stuff about it. And um, <clears throat> he says he didn't think it was a real identity. The, the pictures of Lee Ruby looked photoshopped, like it was a head put onto a, a body without a neck sort of thing. Um, and I must say, I, I tended to see it that way in the end, that... Um, uh, that, that, that uh, it wasn't a real death. I, but I didn't reach a definite view about that. It was definitely a fabricated event. Right. Everything about it was theatrical. So I've I've actually got a friend who swears blind that he knows his mother. Right. So no, uh, knows Lee Rigby's brother. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. So I, I've, I've I I can't say either way, but that's what he's told me. Right. But there, there's I wanted to get into this through the, so the Manchester bombing. Well, let's just finish. I, I, I'm not sure about this. Right. It, it could be, could possibly be right. Right. But uh, it was a very, very doubtful identity. For example, where he'd been was he was he out in Afghanistan or or what, what, different accounts of where he'd been didn't seem to make sense. Um, and if you've got a fabricated narrative, then it goes off in different directions. You, mm. you can't stop it going off in different directions. And that's what I rather felt was happening with the that story. Yeah. Right. Right. That's, okay. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. But I, I don't know either way. I just know that I've told someone about the book that I'd, I was reading about Lee Rigby, and he said, well, that's mental because I know I've spoken to his mother, this, that, and the other. But this is what I wanted to get into. Like, how much how much of these fabricated events that the government put off, how, ma how many of them actually do end up involving hurting normal, regular people? Uh, is that not like that's what I was going to ask about the Manchester thing? Do you think it's possible <clears throat> that these things are planned and or the, the, and that the people are actually getting hurt, or do you think they are all crisis actors? I think the Manchester one was primarily a lot of crisis actors. Yeah, uh, the, all the main people, all the people at the concert, they just went out at the end of the concert. And they heard a bang, and they didn't really see anything, and it was in a separate uh, uh, arcade separate from the main crowd. Um, my friend Richard D. Hall 
who's involved in a lawsuit at the moment, mm. he's the person who's investigated, or more, more thoroughly than anyone else, he's done a big 400-page book in which he investigated each of the 22 families that are alleged to have lost uh, lost people, allegedly 22 deaths. Um, the tw number 22 keeps turning up in that Manchester event. And uh, he, invest he, he said, he told me, he didn't think any of those were real. They weren't real families, they weren't real deaths. Somehow it was composite and scripted. And um, he also went to the inquiry afterwards. <clears throat> so on his website, there's a lot of very detailed videos uh, about this event. Uh, he, he's investigated far more than detail than anyone else. And he's presently being um, taken to court. Uh, sued. Sued. By, by BBC, including that clueless bimbo, Mariana Spring. Oh, really? Who, who is, uh, she is, uh, I think, that, so they are involved in trying to finger him. She lied about working in Russia with the BBC, the little rat. It was, it was something, yeah, she was caught on that. But uh, she came and accosted Richard, where he was selling his books in, in South Wales, uh, and tried to get him to... Uh, At his pop-up shop. He had, he had a put little pop up shop. Yeah, there, a little pop up shop. Yeah, yeah. She, she accosted him, um, uh, and um, I, I think look, I think Rich's got a good lawyer, and I think he's going to succeed. Uh, hopefully, his house is um, in trust to someone else, uh, and they won't be able to take it off him. That's obviously what they want to do. Um, so, fingers crossed. I think he will. I think he will succeed. He's a very careful uh, investigator. But uh, <clears throat> it all revolves around the question of, uh, is this, have you got a real victim? Very much like, if you remember the Alex Jones case with Sandy Hook. I was going to ask about this next. Uh, he sued an enormous amount of money and he caved in, didn't he? Yeah, right. He uh, uh, apology, which he shouldn't do. <laughs> and, and he still, still got sued just the same way, uh, uh, even after caving in. Um, and my friend Jim Fetzer, who published the book, Nobody Died at Sandy Hook, he did not cave in and he still contesting the uh, contesting the uh, judgment anyway it's rather like that Richard has got there's a character in a wheelchair um, who claims that he was um, hit uh, that he was just around where, where the terrorists let the bomb off uh, in the Manchester arena and that his daughter likewise had a, a shrapnel and went through right through her head in one in, in one side out the other and she's made a miraculous recovery um and, and that, that, that those two are, are actually suing richard and um so in a court case it depends very much whether he gets a jury doesn't it jury trial but uh it will be the power of the uh, emotional appeal that will probably sway the court you is know? it so is it criminal then or is it civil is it was he getting sued or is he getting done as a criminal? I think it's a civil court, but I, I, I'm not sure. Right. I'm not sure. Um, yeah. So I think he'll be lucky to get a jury trial in a, in a civil matter. Right. Well, let's wait and see. Um, yeah. But uh, I, I would say that all the recent Fabio Dura events have been... Um, done with actors and dummies and fake blood, and only the very early ones had real blood, uh, like 9-11 and 7-7, and that was the big Madrid one in Spain. Those early ones had real deaths, you know. But um, it's a lot easier to do them with crisis actors. And what what Ole Demigard says, he says, like, um, <clears throat> he reckons it's the same team that goes around the world doing these events. He says it's like a kind of Rocky Horror show on steroids. Uh, they, they 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 know how to mock up these events and, and they've been they've been uh, just sort of do, do, doing them. Um, in a way, you you expect them to continue until people see through it. It's a shabby trick, uh, and we need to realise that it's being done, uh, and and it is theatrical. Is there a real issue with because, for instance, they they swayed people's vote. They well, not that they swayed people's vote. A million people marched against the Iraq War, but what I mean is, they 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 invoked this irrational fear in people using these plots and plans. Mm -hmm. That, and then you say it's a, it's a phantom menace. For instance, when they they was 
they was targeting it all at the Arabs or the Muslims. Now with the state of the borders in Dover and the boats coming over from Calais yeah. with unvetted people, whether they be from sub-Saharan Africa or whether they be from the Middle East, right. do you think there is now a real heightened uh, possibility of a terror attack happening yeah. as a result of these people coming over? Is it is it now feasible? Well, yeah, yeah, so certainly is, yeah. But... Um that would just be only kind of street violence. You wouldn't get the big complicated events, the big spectacular It's just ones. going to get rapes and murders. Oh, yeah, which right. are state fabricated, right? Mm. <coughs> right. I just felt like... I, so I, I watched that interview you did the other day. If anyone wants to watch that, they'll have to, they'll have to go to the um, Patreon. So, But yeah, I was watching that the other day and I, 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 I was listening to you say about that and it made me think... Like that may have been the case. Like they they may they may have been trying to make this fictitious character so to to for whatever reason to get people to vote whatever way or have that have this fear in the back of their mind. But I do really feel like that is a pressing issue now. Like not not particularly terrorist attacks, but like rapes, murders, and this totally, sort of yeah. thing totally, with what's yeah. going on. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, I, don't, I don't think Europe has a bright future. Europe has has blown its options because of its addiction to war. I, I mean, it had it had this great or oh, a decent future. All it had to do was turn on the pipeline, the pipeline of peace and prosperity that had been built, the world's longest pipeline. Just had to switch it on and refrain from bringing NATO right up against the border of Russia. Mm which is impossibly intolerably provocative and nothing whatever to do with maintaining peace. Wasn't there actually supposed to be some sort of agreement to say that they were supposed to go no further? Uh, Absolutely, further yeah. That was to do with Germany the being... The Minsk agreement. Re- that was long before that. Was it? Uh, it, was, it was when Germany was reunified, wasn't it, back in the 80s. Um, when, uh, and, and that reunification, they then dissolved the Warsaw Pact. See, the Warsaw Pact was an enormously valuable string of countries down through the middle of East Europe that was a sort of a, bu- a buffer between NATO and Russia. And uh, I they think... They weren't supposed to be on any side. They were supposed to be... Yeah, well, they were kind of maintained oh, okay. by Russia, weren't they? But uh, that dissolved. And then what happened... That, that was when the promise was made that you alluded to. And then NATO it just kept moving, taking up these countries, and persuading them with financial deals and so on to become part of NATO and uh, <coughs> so there's about 30 countries now belonging to NATO and it's got a defined enemy image and it has massive war game simulations in which Russia is targeted as the, as the enemy and where do people think that will end up uh, I mean it's in America's interest not in Europe's interest uh, I mean if Europe wanted any pleasant future it, it would not seek to have Russia as the enemy. There's no good future for Europe if it wants to have a conflict or or orientated against Russia. Um, I mean, America benefited from the last two world wars, became the dominant power in the world, um, and it's looking forward. War in Europe is, in many ways, quite beneficial for America. It's not such a frightening thing as it is for us. So... um, if, if 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 Europe and NATO is Europe is guided by America, it seems to be, it, it's um, it's not really in its own interest. What well, what about debt bondage, and fractional reserve banking? Do you think the wars and the house of cards that the financial system is? Yeah. Ha- do you think they are interrelated? Do you think the fact that we they've been printing money? Yeah. Quantitative easing for yeah. however long, for decades, yeah. and the uh, the bills so high, and it's. Yeah. Do, you, do you see where I'm going with this? Do you think this it, 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 this might have something to do with it? Like obviously they're talking about World War Three, they're getting everyone primed for it. Is do you think there's a correlation between the financial system being at breaking point and World War Three? Yeah, well, the financial system, it it will traditionally it will. Bomb and attack any country that wants independence from the international banks, won't it? Yeah, but this is the thing. Russia isn't 
Russia do have a central bank, don't they? Yeah, they do. Yeah, that's what uh, I mean. But so. they've they've started the BRICS country back in two thousand and fourteen. Right, they started the BRICS, which is a challenge to the uh, Western banking order. Um, they're and, actually and, backed. They're back, they've got their currency backed by gold. Now, yeah, they, I, I mean really. America's what thirty three trillion dollars in debt. So every dollar is like a check written on a, on a black hole of unrepayable debt of, of many trillions of dollars. And everyone knows it's going to implode sometime. And everyone's holding dollars as as a... Everyone's holding... What's it called? The uh, the debt. Everyone's... Like, like other countries own that, you know? So when that goes tits up, yeah, they're going to be left short, isn't they? Everyone's going to be left short, I think. Yeah, well, well, I think people are apprehensive. We're coming nearer and nearer the time now. Uh, when it when all got tits up, as you say, uh, and uh, it, it currency it works as long as you believe it's going to work, uh, and uh, the, the dollars had this status, and the all the U.S. military bases around the world are there to enforce use of the dollar, make sure people continue using the dollar, and I think this year, two thousand twenty-three, is going to be remembered as the year of de-dollarization. It's a terrific trend now sweeping the world which is directly due to Russia's position over Ukraine, of challenging the empire, uh, realising um, everyone assumed Russia would cave in with all the sanctions, and it didn't. The ruble's doing OK. So, uh, what, so I've got to ask, what happens in your view in a world, in a multipolar world, what happens for... So <clears throat> the, the, the de-dollarisation is a real thing. So rather than having the dollar as a, uh, the currency, the, um, the the world currency, yeah, what do you see? Do you see as a single currency stepping up and f- taking its place? Well, nobody knows the answer to that. Yeah, do, do they? Uh, yeah. Um, the, the alternative is a multipolar world of Brits currencies mm. uh, and, and currencies based on gold. In simple language, that means that. Whoever's running the currency can't just print a load of money whenever they need it. It's dawned on everyone what America does, that whenever they print more trillions of dollars, that is cheating and taking away wealth from all the other people who use dollars. I think that has now dawned on people, and it's the reason why people don't want dollars anymore. And um, so the, the BRICS currencies are just finding their feet now and are starting to work, and more and more countries now are trading directly without using the dollar, which wasn't allowed before. You know, before, countries like Iraq, the war would start because they wanted their own independent currency. And, and they wanted to trade oil in euros or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And that was, everyone understood, that was the reason why they'd get, get bombed. Just really, just like Germany in World War Two, wasn't it? They started their own independent currency. Um, and 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 um, that seems to be not happening now because China and Russia are just too big. So it doesn't look as if America can intentionally start a war with Russia or China. I mean, touch wood. I may be maybe wrong because they're they're too big, and therefore their de-dollarization is inspiring many countries all around the world to move away from the dollar, and uh, that that is. As Putin said, th- that change is tectonic and irreversible. What, what happens, do you think, if China go to Taiwan? Do you reckon that is war for everyone else? I don't think China wants war. Ch- China, The Chinese philosophy uh, involves avoiding conflict. and uh, th- 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 They have got their own interpretation of the Taiwan situation, um, which involves just letting it be or, or moving slowly or diplomacy uh, and uh, what the only thing that is intolerable for them is uh, America coming along and saying Taiwan is quite separate and independent from China which is uh, inconsistent with uh, the whole legal basis of that, of, of that island um, so China will not in itself seek a conflict. I, I think China seeks prosperity, and uh, <clears throat> a whole lot of things are developing in China, um, uh, and uh, it's making great technological improvements and developments. Uh, so I, I th- 
I don't think it in any way wants wants a uh, wants a war. When you say China seeks prosperity, yeah, what does that mean or what does that even look like? Because when I see things like when I see China, I'm seeing people getting their face named and shamed on a billboard because they jaywalked or yeah, they're yeah. getting. Well, I'm not coming on that, but just if you look, if you talk to so over the last forty or fifty years, every Chinese book can see how their villages have been pulled out of poverty and how the standard of living has got better. I, I, I think that is a palpable thing in, in, in China, what, why they, uh, they believe in their government for that straightforward reason. That, uh, because they'd rather be living amongst the cameras than the wildlife. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, hang on. Uh, I don't think coming out of poverty is quite the same as that. But... Well, um, I agree, we are concerned about... But they come from rural areas, don't they? And then they go into the city, don't they? That's how they've got them out of it, so so to speak. They All the rural areas are poor, and then they they commute or they move, rather they move into warehouses, generally speaking. And they, right. Like a little 15-minute city warehouse, they get to live in and work in and right. eat in. Yeah. I don't know, it's just, uh, there's there's... I think we get a very... We get a westernised, very uh, uh, fairy tale view of it. Well, don't it forget they have got that, the high IQ nations of the world are around there in, in Asia. One hundred six mean Chinese IQ, uh, and uh, one hundred six. One hundred six is the mean average. Mean, and that is number one nation for producing scientific, publishing scientific papers uh, last year. Um, uh, and various various nations around there have got that high IQ for whatever reason. Uh, I think as where the future culture will blossom around there in Asia. Oh, interesting words. Yeah, whereas Europe is done in now. The good times are over for Europe. Uh, it's going to be descending, uh, l losing the affluence because it's addiction to war, losing its affluence, uh, and uh, it'll sort of turn brown. Uh, in your opinion... <laughs> How long is it before we're like South Africa and we've got rolling uh, uh, internet shortages, blackouts on the electric and things like that? Well, I don't have a crystal ball, but, but the, the, this century, the, 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 it will be evident that the good times are over for Europe uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's made these catastrophic mistakes and... Uh, I mean, right ha right now, it's it's generating wealth for America. That's what it's doing. America's selling all this gas and oil to Europe. Uh, and um, uh, America's done very well out of this crisis we're in now. Um, so I, I, I don't see any bright future for, for Europe, really. I think, I think that's over now, I'm afraid. Oh, exciting times ahead. <laughs> Sorry about that, yeah. Yes. I'm, I'm all right. It's my son that I worry about, you know. Don't really know how I'm supposed to explain to a twelve-year-old like the good times are over, kid. You got to uh, you got to buckle up because these things are going to get it going to get rocky. Uh, Hundred thousand unvetted migrants through the border every year. Like ten years, that's a million. It's probably it's probably worse than that anyway. With all the other ways of getting in, you know. We don't know how bad it is realistically. We only know what they tell us, don't we? Uh -huh. Yeah. I mean, Europe's had a glorious past for, you know, a thousand years. Um, and I think the future is moving to, to a know, what, now. What, what, when you say glorious, I mean, the last thousand, the last thousand years. <laughs> well, it, it's it's been a centre of... Of culture, perhaps I shouldn't have said that. Centre of culture, evil. Uh, 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 maybe evil. Yeah, <laughs> uh, a place where other, other people in other countries wish they could be. Right, mm. that, that's what I meant to say. Thanks for correcting me on that. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is uh, it is it not is it true that we get all all of that sort of uh, all the intelligence and stuff? So that, well, not all the intelligence. Is it true that maths comes from Arabs? Is that true? I reckon that the first the first sort of university was out that way, wasn't it? And a lot, yeah, a lot of medieval times. A lot of brilliant culture came from mm. Arabs, and you know what's happened to it now? Last four hundred years, they seem to have l lost all the great right. science and alchemy uh, they they used to, used to have. Is that not but, a result but, uh, of the uh, 
what was it? What they call it? The um, oh, the enlightenment. Is that as a result of that? Were they enlightened? They were so enlightened they forgot about everything else. Or I don't know. I don't know about time. Liberalism. Enlightenment, no. Maths, a lot of maths, yeah, came from e Europe, Greece and stuff. Yeah, but um, that's, um, now kids can hardly do maths, can they? Well, they're hardly, hardly learning maths. It's because it's racist, Nick. Racist, right. Yeah. Can we get some cold air in there, please? I'm absolutely sweating. Thank you. So this new book, this new book you've written, Nick. Oh, yeah. The Bard and the Gunpowder Plot. Yeah, it's a cheerful, upbeat and notes without all the uh, all the grim stuff about other books. And it's about the real identity of the great, greatest English genius, um, uh, William Shakespeare. And that, no person of that name ever lived. And the, his works are attributed to a guy who literally could not read or write. He couldn't sign his own name. Uh, and uh, lived in Stratford-on-Avon successful businessman um uh, 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 the man who could who couldn't read and write was a successful businessman yeah yeah he did trading um wool and stuff um uh, maybe a butcher worked as a butcher um uh, and uh his father might have been a town mayor uh, and he lent money a, a money lender was he a freemason i don't no he wasn't no no a anyway the people who yeah, well, that's the gunpowder plot. So what, who's, what imagery is that, though? That's some Freemasonic imagery, mate. Well, it is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, ha hang on, l l let me come Sorry. on to that. Let me come on to that. Um, the, the actual author was very near to the English crown, a very distinguished earl, um, uh, and uh, there's more than one author, must have been more than one, but the, the point is they were very close to the crown of England, which was partly why the, the real name could not be used. So I would say that uh, people who wanted a, a sort of left-wing socialist story of this country bumpkin who somehow learnt Latin and Greek and wrote all the plays, well, no, that did never happen. And the actual story is much more right-wing about this um, Earl, top Earl, Edward de Vere, uh, Earl of Oxford, uh, who uh, was very close to Queen Elizabeth. This is Tudor England. Uh, and uh, that was the source, the tremendous creative source of these plays. And the reason why it, his real identity got lost is, is a very fascinating and powerful one. So I think anyone's interested in, in the nature of creativity and genius, this is a, a must story, it really is. And it may, you may find it kindles a new interest in Shakespeare that you never had before, OK? So the Earl of Ox Oxford is actually... It was Shakespeare? Prime, it was the prime candidate who wrote the plays, yeah. There would have been other people as well. Uh, there's too much for just one person to have done, but he he was the main character, yeah, m main author. Right. Uh, and Francis Bacon That's was true. related to him, uh, uh, but he would have helped produce and publish the plays. What Francis happened? Francis Bacon was related to the Earl of Oxford. Yeah, right. yeah. Uh, what happened in 1623? An amazing publication of 36 plays. Uh, Francis Bacon would have overseen and helped get all that together. Um, a, a poet called Ben Johnson. That those two together um, would have actually produced the, the plays. How yeah. how do you find that out? How do you? I know it's what you do, but I'm just saying like, how do you get to the bottom of that? Like, well, where's you? Like, obviously, if someone. Well, I start, started off. Uh, Some I knew British philosopher John Michel. He wrote uh, the, the who wrote Shakespeare, um, uh, and he didn't know at all. He's just totally agnostic. Um, well, I just kind of sniff around and, um, how do you find out? Um, well, I, I like to think maybe I'm, I'm a philosopher uh, and you, you, you discern what is real and what is illusory, the, yes. the difference. Yes. And I have to be a bit detached from events to be able to do that. And that's the one and only thing I can do in this world. Uh, and uh, and I, I enjoy telling stories and putting the story together. Uh, and uh, I feel we're at a wonderful moment in history after centuries of struggling the identity of Shakespeare I mean the whole library has been written on the subject um, they were at a wonderful moment and I'm not anywhere I'm just putting pulling together what I feel has been done by various other uh, people pulling together the story um, and uh, 
I wouldn't say anything I put there is, is original. I, I'm just telling the story of, of, of the great geniuses, wonderful geniuses, Elizabeth e and Ethan England, and this new humanism of the Renaissance, a, a glorious period of optimism in England, uh, and uh, how these plays were, uh, uh, how an anonymous author came, came to write them, yeah. Uh, um, it's very interesting, that's what I mean when I say fascinating. Yeah. So I try to link it up with the gunpowder plot, as you can see. Yeah, right. Which is uh, cl very close in time, you see, at 1605. So you get a transition from the glorious Elizabethan age, at least it was, as long as you weren't a Catholic, it was glorious. For the Catholics, it wasn't so good. You'd be hunted down and persecuted and tortured, and, you know. Um, that's the traditional re religion of England for a thousand years. Um, but uh, other, what generally is remembered as, as, a, as a great era of English history. And then after that, you get the, the Stuart, uh, uh, and this king who comes down from Scotland, um, uh, and uh, a very different atmosphere. And he then has, he then needs this story, the gunpowder plot, and he's got his very, very powerful intelligence agency, uh, agency uh, the, the Cecils, um, who they feature a lot in Shakespeare plays, actually, the Cecils, a lot of characters uh, l looking at them, so very sinister and powerful, keep tabs on everyone. And they, they mocked up this terrific event to give the, the new king legitimacy, right? So nobody sees any gunpowder. That, that, that's the key thing, gunpowder plot. No. There, there's no witness saying, oh, God, what are all these barrels of gunpowder about? You know? Uh, and uh, November the 5th, when allegedly it's thought the plot is discovered and the Parliament is due to meet later that same day, at midnight it's discovered, uh, you'd expect a whole lot of people to see the army rolling out all these barrels of gunpowder, dozens of barrels of gunpowder from right underneath the House of Lords. Well, there's no such account at all. And you're not allowed to say that. The, the king creates the drama, the narrative. This is... Um, what we might call phantom terror, because nothing actually happens. The only people actually terrified are the alleged plotters. But that's that really, that, what did you just say? The king creates the what? Well, the king generates the master narrative. He tells the right. story. Right, yes. Right. Yes. And we, we just had, a couple of years ago, the king just unraveled the master narrative of the climate change. Don't you think that? Don't you think that's the thing? The same thing? Is the king doing it then? Is probably the king is, doing yeah. It now? Probably is the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, Sorry, go on, please, Nick. Um, I interrupted. Um, well, the only people actually terrified are the alleged plotters. The two of them, uh, alleged master plotters, who would have really known what was happening, quickly get bumped off. They get shot in, in a quite pointless manner. They were trying to surrender. They were unarmed, and yet they get shot. Um, because they could have told what was really going on, okay? And then others, like Guy Fawkes, are, are literally tortured and put on the rack, uh, and until they come out on the rack, they come out with the story that is required. So the story we've told, we're told, which goes, which uh, becomes part of British religion, literally. Uh, every every priest on November every year has to thank God for our deliverance so the priest get, sorry the king gets this terrific aura to him is given the credit for discovering this plot okay uh, and the Catholics in in this country lose all hope whatsoever Catholics are finished in this country of the gunpowder plot um, that, that is the purpose of the gunpowder plot to damn and delegitimize the Catholics yeah okay? right that's what I thought so, so uh, always state of public terror it creates an enemy for you which is very handy for those in charge oh so you're so you're, so you're suggesting that it was the original false flag one absolutely of the, yeah. one of, right I'm with you this right. is the original Fabio terror event uh, uh, Britain discovered a diabolical neck why are the uh, Freemasons drawing about it well uh, that's uh, divine providence was uh, you need to allude to, to, to divine providence that, that the king discovered this fiendish plot just in time. Yeah, and um, it's given a whole religious significance. like um, Divine providence? Yeah, like after 9-11, George Bush was in the churches saying how oh, oh, God has given us this crusade and so on, you, you know. 
So, so King James um, was claiming in the master narrative, mm. that this was divine providence that they discovered the plot just in time. Right. And um, so the villainous people, allegedly part of it, gets tortured. <clears throat> and and um, a story is mocked up. And you get Catholic authors, um, mainly in, uh, in France, for example, uh, talking about, well, uh, who, who saw this gunpowder? You know, you know, were there any barrels anywhere? Um, and what, what was actually going on? What were these plotters actually doing? There was a bunch of them who would meet in London now and then, and they were probably planning to go and join some sort of war in, in Flanders, um, I guess in France, uh, in Flanders in the continent. Uh, th 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 that seems to be what they're planning. I mean, you can get angry people, angry Catholics saying, this is unbearable, we can't stand this oppression any longer, let's rise up and do something. <clears throat> you can get people like that having ha angry chats in the pub, but that's a far cry from actually doing something, right? Mm. Now, these key plotters... I said the two of them were bumped off right away. They were seen coming and going from Cecil's house in the Strand. Cecil was the chief, you know, yeah. intelligence agency. Yeah. So some people, some witnesses are puzzled. So around midnight, these guys coming and going from Cecil's house. What, what's going on here? Uh, this is what we call uh, moles and patsies. Uh, a mole is somebody in what, what is thought to be a conspiracy who's actually. R reporting on what's going on. And Patsy uh, is the scapegoat. Patsy is the scapegoat. I mean, like Guy, Guy Fawkes might have been some sort of Patsy. Um, we'll never know. At the end of the story, you never know exactly what these people <laughs> were, were planning to do, do you? Uh, but uh, certainly Cecil got his hooks onto a couple of the key characters uh, and, and they were expecting some sort of reward. I think one of them was allowed off afterwards. But... Um, I think the moral is, if MI5 promise you a reward, raw reward for collaborating with them, don't do it. Yeah, you know? right. And don't believe them. Yeah, no, right. they're more likely going to whack you. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. But you didn't, you skirted around it. Why are the Freemasons drawing about it? Well, that's... that's, that's that part is of Freemasonry, the, isn't it? Just well, it looks like it, yeah. It does. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a picture of the Pope and the devil uh, being somehow conspiring uh, with... Guy Fawkes, who's just outside the House of Lords. Uh, uh, because the Freemasons in end times, I assume, were very, very part of the... Um... Well, wait a minute, wait a minute, uh, wait a minute. S sorry. Um, no, not quite. Freemasons start in the 17th century, 17th, 17th, yeah. 18th century. That's when they first appear. Yeah, right. Now, this is the century before Freemasons appear, so so let's, um, let's be a bit careful here. Um, All right, well, it, but, okay, they're not Freemasons, but... That most definitely looks like Freemason imagery. Well, uh, okay, yeah. It was, a, it was a picture of a popular consumption showing uh, the work of the devil. Oh, no, there's an eye. There's, there's a, they've, yeah. got, they've got the um, they've got the. Hebrew. That's some divine divine revelation which helps the king to yeah, disclose right, the, right. the plot just in time. Yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting that that imagery there. I find that very fascinating. So that does look like the eye and. Yeah, so so Guy Fawkes not gets not just burnt on the bonfire every November fifth, but for centuries it was compulsory for church sermons around that time to include him and and give. So it was in the Book of Common Prayer to to give thanks for our, our, our deliverance, uh, and uh, I mean Catholics couldn't possibly have benefited from this plot at all. There were a whole lot of Catholics in in the parliament that would have got blown up if it had worked and there was no possible Catholic successor. The prospect of Britain going Catholic didn't really exist anymore. So there wasn't any credible motive, uh, if you imagine Catholics doing this. That was the official story. Um, there was nothing they could have gained from it. Um, and the Pope certainly didn't encourage um, any such violent actions. So uh, there, there was no no <coughs> no credible motive they could have had. Right. So it was the state doing what they do four hundred years ago. Yeah, I mean, wonder if if there's some dreadful knowledge somehow preserved by the, by English intelligence of how to do things uh, and and uh, how effective it is. Uh, and uh, British people need to wake up and say, uh, pr prosecute anyone involved in, in conspiring to deceive the British people in this way, in this totally diabolical art form. Talking about treason, 
All right. Um, the King's Coronation. Did you watch it? No. No. Did you have you ever seen the Queen's Coronation? I might have done. Might have done. Oh, there was. Uh, I shouldn't have brought it up because I can't. I can't exactly remember the terminology that he said. Insincerely. Uh huh. What does insincerely mean? No, insincerity. Sincerely. No, 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 no. Sincerity. Insincerity. 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 Yeah. Well, what does it mean then? Well, I mean, insincerity would mean you're insincere, wouldn't it? Insin. Oh, fuck. Not sincere. Yeah. Right. Not right. But you don't mean it, right? So, when he, when the king was taking his coronation, he actually he said it insincerely, it, not insincerity, but he said it in. Oh, it's really hard to get your head. Well, around. What is the point you're making? Right, the point I'm making is when he's taking his oath, yeah. he's not being sincere, and he's saying it to you. He's saying blatantly, "This is." This is being said insincerely. Uh -huh. I just wondered if you think that's like something worth noting when your old king's taking his coronation oath and his affirmation that he's going to abide by the uh, uphold the law and make sure he keeps everything in the in the subject's interest. Hmm. Like, if he's saying that insincerely, do you yeah. think that's worth noting? Yeah, well, I couldn't. I couldn't say really. No. Do you think uh, it's important if he's lying about his oath, is what I'm saying? Well, I don't know how you'd know he's lying. Because he that, said so. it insincerely. He, he, said yeah. the, he said the phrase, yeah, in, oh, I'm going to have to get it up. I'll get it up and I'll, I'll tell Whatever you. Said. Right. I'll, I'll send it over to you, email or something or other. Um, right, is there anything else that we didn't go over? Do you feel like there's anything that we didn't talk about, Nick? What else could you talk about? I feel like we've done all the books. Yeah, well, we're leaving from this leaving one. From the current, it's another time. Apart from that one, yeah. Right. Are we looking at this one, Steve? <coughs> we thought it'd be a good idea not to go down this avenue this this this, uh, this afternoon. Well, it's there on Amazon, not on Amazon. Not on Amazon, definitely. Where not, can no. they get it from, Nick? Well, you can't really. They, they, you. They closed down my publisher. It's on the Is run now. Your, how many copies have you got then? Well, not many, uh, and it, well, two. Um, it was it was the best-selling revisionist book, but for a few years, it, even after being closed down by Amazon, it still sold remark remarkably well. Um, Revision but, but, revisionism, uh, for anyone that doesn't know, is that stuff that Nick would get arrested for in Russia. But well, that's that's disputed. Well, there's that, about isn't it? 19 European countries that will arrest you for it. I, I'm not sure if Russia's one of those, but. Uh, uh, but you, you, I just got a state for everyone that doesn't know. Like your, yours is pretty methodical. The reason for your doing so, it's all it's based around maths and stuff like that. No. Well, yeah, I, I analysed all the chemical residues, cyanide in the walls, and also I got an amazing scoop of um, the British intelligence decrypts over thirteen months from the breaking the Enigma codes in World War Two, and we were listening in to the German labour camps, nineteen forty two to forty three. Uh, and uh, well, you can see wire transmissions from the labour camps. Yeah, yeah, from all different camps. Detailed accounts of what's happening week by week. That's amazing. Uh, and uh, I, I published it. That it was released after a fifty-year ban in the mid nineties, and no historians would touch it. So I just went down to the National Archives queue, checked them out, and and it's in my book. And so that is a scoop that I had in that book. It's in this one. Yeah. yeah. Oh right. Yeah, I mean, obviously historians didn't like them because there's no trace of any Holocaust going on that was recorded there. Um, so, is there a record of the of the swimming pools in there? No, not in the decrypts. No, no. But I mean, that's just something um, sort of vis visible and uh, fairly evident. I don't know why people f focus so much on it. Well, I don't know. People get their people have a hard time getting their head round it, don't they? Apparently. Well, yeah, why. no, you've got to think. From school, Nick, we've been told the narrative, the meta-narrative from yeah. school, you've had that embedded into your brain. Yeah. So when someone turns around and says, well, did you know they had PE lessons and they went swimming? And, and there was a British soccer team there. <laughs> right. So yeah. when, when you, a picture of it, yeah. Right. So when you say that to people, sort of, 
So for them to get their nut around it, I think, a little bit. Well, they just need to understand the purpose of it. It's a hard-working labour camp. Mm. Uh, uh, and uh, so there were amenities, amenities put on for the residents to um, get efficient work out of them. Yeah. Blinder, and if you want to know more, because we're on YouTube, you're going to have to read the book, buy the book, contact Nick for the book. You can get a PDF online. You can uh, get a free PDF. For that. That's all for that. There you go. Yeah. He's giving it away. Yeah. All right, Blinder. Yeah, I feel like we can't go too deep on that one. No, no, definitely not. Being on the tube of the... <laughs> anyway. Questions. Right. What? Questions in the comments. Questions in the comments. Have you... Have you sent them? We got some questions from from some people that are viewing. All right, if you don't mind, Nick. Sure, yeah. How long before digital currency currency replaces all cash? Question for Nick. Well, I'm very flattered that he thinks I should be able to answer that. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> digital, yeah. Pass. Ask me another. Right, pass. I forgot to pull... Uh, well done, Terminus, because I forgot to uh, circle back to this. Crop circles. Uh-huh. Who makes them? Well, I'm very flattered that uh, I think I might know the answer to this. <laughs> um, I, I did actually go. First time for many, many years. Uh, a friend took me out to see a crop circle this, this, this summer, uh, and he found a couple of them. And uh, they were hardly... Everyone thinks the phenomenon's over and it's gone, uh, and they're hardly so they're hardly trampled on. It. It's quite moving to see them again. Wiltshire, yeah, yeah, uh, and uh, so they're, they're happening there. again. They're, they're still there. Only about thirty a year, as opposed to one hundred and thirty they, they they used to be. Thirty a year still happening it each year. Well, something resembling that twenty or thirty. Years. That's yeah. absolutely mental. Yeah. But you've got no idea if, as to if they're aliens or people. In your, your discernment, well, in, your, uh, in your heart of hearts. What, what, what we find, what we notice this year, is that you get lovely circular patterns without any access to the centre. In other words, the centre is undisturbed wheat. Okay? So you've got to ask yourself, who can make these quite complicated circular patterns without being able to get to the centre? I'll leave it at that. I don't know. I've seen a video before with a chap. We had a, he had a plank of wood attached to two strings. Yeah. And I, I've, I thought that was how they did it. To be honest with yeah, you. But can you make a circle without having anything in the centre? Without having anything in the centre. Yeah, you just got undisturbed wheat at the centre. Undisturbed wheat. So it still stood up. Yeah. It's undisturbed. So he could have got to the centre and started going round it with his little bit of wood and his. Strings, no. That's all. Always. Well, that's the, point. <laughs> the point is that you, you, if you can't get to the centre, how do you do it? What do you mean if you can't get to the centre? Well, come on. Uh, um, undisturbed wheat means that you've got a field of wheat without anything at the centre of a circle. Right. So this is the this is the undisturbed wheat. Yeah. Right. So I walk up to it with my thing. And then I'll just walk around it with my thing. No, you can't go anywhere near it. Can't go anywhere near it. Yeah, because you'd leave a trace. The point point of, of of the wheat is that if you tread on it once, the wheat is permanently broken and laid down. Yeah, it, it won't spring up again. So it will remember anywhere if you've walked, it will show it. But is it not grown in uniform things, though? Is it not grown in, like, lines? Could no. you not? Could you not? Oh, well, I see. Could well, you not step around? Like, I don't. No, you can't. No, you, you can't. need to go out there and have a look at it. I do. Uh, yeah, I do. Yeah. All right, sorry. All right, so that one, we don't know if it's aliens, but we definitely think it ain't humans. Uh, yeah, I, I got on with that. That's that, um, <laughs> that, uh, uh, the think, I think there's a. I, I, I think there's a definitive argument that if you get complicated mandalas where you cannot get anywhere near the centre. That isn't a team of circle makers. Right. I've got another question from Paranormal Channel X. Right. Who is Momon? Who is her? Momon. Is this a joke? <laughs> it's, I'll spell it for you. M-O-M-M-O-N. Momon. 
It was a real, real question, not a joke. Yeah, well, I'll pass. Ask me another. Pass that one. I don't know. I have a feeling like mom and something like Moloch. I'm not certain, though. don't know. Is there any more questions? Because that's all that I, I was... That's all that I've had. Moon landing. Moon landing, Nick. Right, well, glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me tell you a story. On the 50th anniversary of the moon landing, our group, our Keep Talking group, had a debate, okay? We are the only place at like this um, Camden pub. We had a, we scheduled to have a debate, and I got the top sceptic, uh, Nexus, uh, does the Nexus magazine, um, Marcus, Marcus Allen, uh, is Britain's top moon landing sceptic. And for the purpose of the debate, I, I debated that, yes, they had gone. So I have... I have taken the view that yes, they did go, and people think I'm absurdly old-fashioned for this reason. But Jim, when you've denied the Holocaust and various other things, you really want to believe in something. You, know? <laughs> yeah, you need to believe in something. Uh, and and uh, so I, I said yes, they had gone the moon. They really went. They really came back. And I lost the debate. I knew I would. I lost it by 11, 11 votes. No, they didn't. Three, yes, they did. And three that they did, but by some other means, not by the way we're shown. So that was the that was the view of our keep talking group um, in, in a debate we had on on the subject. Um, obviously, the longer a time goes by without anyone else, any human being going through the Van Allen belt, the more of the human race will not believe it ever happened. Yeah. Uh, 1972 was the last time any human being went through the Van Allen radiation belt that, that we know of, okay? Which is quite a long time ago. And there's a very reasonable argument, if they could do it, if they really could do it, then why haven't they done it since? Yeah, right. And why has it never happened since? Do you believe that they can go through the Van Allen radiation belt, though? In tinfoil? Well, in I, I have to admit, I, I'm not sure about this. Normally, I, I have you know, I've had definite views about things, but... Uh, I think we're in a state of cognitive dissonance on this mm, matter. Mm, possibly. Mm. I mean, well, I can see both both points of view, um, uh, but what I think is important is that a good half of the British people now don't believe we ever went. Uh, I, I think I think it's. I would guess it's, and I've said it's very age stratified. Mm. The younger people are much yeah. more sceptical. Yeah, right. And the, so I think I think what's important and interesting is that we've got this terrific divide on this, you know, fairly, in some ways, fairly crucial issue. You may say, why is it crucial? I think it's crucial whether you believe in science at all or what scientists tell you. I think it's if, crucial. If, if they ma sorry? Well, no, sorry to interrupt, but I think it's crucial in, in as much that it, it's, another, it's another illustration of how the powers that be will lie and just make people believe whatever they see. Yeah. So, yeah, well, uh, that certainly would be, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so to what extent you believe authority or scientists, um, it, it, I think it's very crucial on that question. I mean, I'm a member of an astronomical society, Royal, Astron Royal Astronomical Society, <coughs> and I would say astronomers may not be very good at communicating with the public, but I don't think they're any good at deception. I, I don't think they practice deception in that way. Uh, I, I would say they're fairly straight, rather remote people maybe, but I don't think they're into deception. Uh, and I would find it hard to believe that uh, all the astronomers involved in that were covering up some great secret. Yeah, I think everything's so compartmentalised. I no one knows what they're doing about in in the, in the scheme of deceptive yeah. sort of actions. I think they'd have it compartmentalised and they wouldn't necessarily be privy to the deception, so to speak. Yeah, very true, yeah. Compartmentalised, yeah, yeah. But um, anyway, I mean, there will come a time when India or China will fly over that area, or one of those areas, and either the US landing gear will be there or it won't. Mm. So it's nice to know that there will be a moment of revelation that, that we, we will surely find out the truth uh, in the not too distant future. Uh, is there anything there or not? So um, what about nukes then? Nuclear bombs. Are they real? Were they just to keep the fear up? Well, again, it's remarkable the way the fear of nuclear weapons has faded away. 
I mean, I remember back in the 1980s, there was a deep dread throughout Europe that a nuclear war was coming. Well, they don't, they don't, but they don't publish things like threads anymore, though, do they? Like threads? Mm, threads. What was that? Was that not the name of the program where the, the, those atomic bombs were going off in Birmingham and the rest of it? Oh, what's that? Oh, well, I don't know, but um, um, I, I mean the social engineering the, programs and things. Yeah, I mean, if if nukes work, we're coming towards a situation where America's putting nukes into Europe now, which is a terrible thing um, for Europe. Uh, you know, Germany, Romania, putting these these nukes targeted at Russian cities, which can take nukes, can be fitted with nukes. And are, are they, you know, w will they go off? Um, I mean, it is, I find it eerie throughout my life that the nukes have not gone off. Think of all the psychopaths who had their finger on the trigger. Mm. And how come, how come it's never happened? And uh, so it's understandable that um, people are beginning to doubt when the nukes really go off, you know. And... Uh, well, it's, it's, it's not just that. It's when people look at videos from the 60s, the 50s, whenever it was, whenever it was, so like <clears throat> when they were doing uh, Operation Fishbowl and things like that, and you see video footage yeah. of a flash, a bomb, a, a blast going past the video of some sort of house and yeah. some car, and it's like, well, how are we seeing this footage? Because... Like everything else in front of the camera is being destroyed, but where's the camera then, sort of thing, you know? Well, there's a case that Hiroshima and Nagasaki were not real nukes, and it was a firestorm. Well, and the firestorm wasn't any different from many, that, many other Japanese cities that were incinerated. That was the underlying question of uh, yeah. are nukes real? So yeah. that's what I was. Yeah. Right, thank I you. I mean, in terms of the science, I would have thought nuclear power does really work, uranium is fissile. And if you concentrate the uranium, it should come to a critical mass where it will blow up. I, I, I would have thought the science does definitely indicate that that would happen. Um, and I would have thought there's enough nuclear tests uh, showing that they go off. But um, um, so once again, I have to say, I, 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 I'm not really sure. Um, I find it hard to imagine that uh, nukes wouldn't work. But... Um, You'd like to think they would. I, I think we're getting to a situation where we're, we're unclear about so many things these days, aren't we? Hundred percent. We're living in the age of deception. Mate. Age of deception. Yeah. <coughs> I mean, written. if nukes if nukes do work, I would have thought they should let one off every five or ten years, just to remind everyone, just so politicians can gather around and see it happening. That we don't want this to uh, get out of control. Uh, I mean, certainly we have had thirty years without. All those little nukes, all the nukes, horrible nukes in Europe, due to diplomacy that really worked, uh, treaties, the INF and INF treaty, and that's, those have expired now. So nukes can be put back into Europe, and um, nobody seems bothered. Well, Russians are, are very bothered by it, but Europeans don't seem at all worried. Uh, and uh, I mean, Britain is increasing trident nuclear warheads. What the hell is it doing that for? We've got about 150 nuclear warheads for Trident, and that is being doubled now. I mean, that's enough for every city in, in the world. What the hell are Britain making more nuclear warheads for? It's some, like some force of pure evil going on in this country. Uh, BAE systems getting a backhand, mate, and it's just all, I don't know, they're making fucking, excuse me, but they're making, I don't know, some sort of cereal bars, really. Then, How do you mean? Yeah, I, I'm suggesting that it's completely fictitious, mate. It's the way that I sleep at night, Nick. Uh, it's all make-believe, and I don't have to worry about it. Well, the trouble is, we hardly believe the word of politicians these days. That's what I mean, and they tell um, me they're real. So, um, you know? But surely nukes have gone off. We have seen, seen real mushroom clouds of real nukes. Have we not? Have we? Well, it's all about perspective, isn't it? We're like, I've I've used cameras and that. I know you can, you can make things look. No, different. it's all there. Also, remains of ultra of great heat, like after the Trinity explosions in in uh, when uh, fir first getting the nuke to work, uh, the desert sand has turned to glass. 
the, the, the bits of glass well, from bikini. Britain. Well, it might also have been bikini. That's with the hydrogen bomb. I think mm. yeah, uh, and the sand turns to glass with great heat. Uh, I mean, th that isn't all made up, is it? Th those are real physicists talking about what they experienced. Well, yeah, no, but we, <coughs> we know that we can heat up sand and make glass, don't we? We know that's a real thing. Right. We've seen them blowing glass. Yeah. Like creating that. So I, I would I would I would presume if you heat if you heat the glass hot enough it will turn into heat heat the sands rather hot enough it will turn to glass. I'd rather not think about nukes being real though. Thank you very much, Nick. So stop trying to prove them to me, basically. I need to go to the lab boys. Right. Is that is that all right? Oh no. Actually before I go to the lab i going to give you one of these. I know you got one, Nick, but oh, no right. one leaves this show empty-handed, so have, right, yeah. have free white privilege vouchers. Oh, thanks, Jim, yeah. Give some to your friends, please. All right. We'll do some more comments while you're going, George. You're going to do some more comments? Do you want to keep it going? Uh, uh, not really, because I've got, uh, I've got people will and shit, so I need to get out. <sighs> yeah. Is that okay? All right, yeah. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. I've got people will and shit, so I've got to fuck off. <laughs> or... Thank you for tuning in. Thanks, Nick, for coming. Right, well. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about this. I'm very unprofessional, but I do need to go to the toilet, so I've got to... Okay, right. Is that all right?